What I want to do here is a little bit different than what I usually do in Bible lessons and verses and connecting scriptures, is to show a summary of how we arrived at the situation we have today in the, in the present day so-called churches, in the system of error as we call it. What I want to look at here, you could base this pretty much on Romans chapter 1, how they've exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and they've suppressed the truth, and they've been given over to a reprobate mind. And I mean, certainly a reprobate mind teaches the wretched man and the Romans wretch and sin every day and filthy rags. That, that, that's got to be a reprobated mind that teaches that kind of stuff. But they think they're godly. In Romans 1.18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Well, see, what's happened today is they're, like the prophet says, they're eating the fruit of lies in the churches because they've suppressed the truth. But this has happened over a progression of a long, long period of time. And that's what I want to talk about here. See, in the scriptures, you got clarity defined as darkness and light, evil and good, bitter and sweet. Good tree don't bear bad fruit, bad tree don't bear good fruit. It's very, very clear, the way of life and the way of death, as the early Christians called it. Very plain. You either obey or you disobey. It's everyone's personal choice. Nothing's going to hinder that choice except your own unwillingness to stop your sin and come to God. But the religious systems of the world got a hold of this thing, and they represent Christianity as something way, way far away from this simplicity of this darkness and light, good and evil message. They blended it all together is what they've done. So in that, they handle the Word of God deceitfully, as we always point out, like that Second Corinthians 4 scripture says, that we've renounced the hidden things of darkness and the craftiness of men in the deceit and handle the Word of God deceitfully. Well, that's what they do, of course, as we show over and over again. But what I want to do here is, if you drew an imaginary line from about the middle 3rd century Rome, not any particular date, but middle 3rd century, 4th century Rome, right up to the 1500s and to the present day, you'll see how this monopoly of suppression of the Word of God began in a tyrannical oppression of human liberty back in ancient Rome to gain control of a church system that would dictated how salvation would be had through a filter of canonal authority. And I'm not just talking about the Catholic Church here. So it was a canonal authority that defined exclusively what the Bible meant by a religious elite that work feverishly to keep themselves in power and keep everybody else dumbed down, kind of like what's happening today. Keep them in ignorance of the pure teachings of Christ, forbidding them to even have the Word of God in their own language. So, of course, what happened from the days of the apostles up through 3rd, 4th century, they, they fought in Rome to get the gospel, the Bible, the scrolls, out of the Greek language, the common language of the people, into Latin, which was the scholarly language in, in, the, in the rhetoric of Rome, in the pagan rhetoric of Rome, in their colleges, so to speak. So you can trace every false doctrine and every fallacy from Augustine's time in 3rd, 4th century Rome up to the Reformation, starting in about the 1500s, to our present day. Now, I know a lot of stuff happened in between, and there was a lot of exceptions and all kinds of things. I understand all that stuff. Well, I'm doing is simplifying it here in this little triangle, showing you in this unholy triangle, so to speak, where all this stuff came from that they're teaching today. Just like from Augustine's just war, in his just war theory, like there could be such a thing, since then, every war and inquisition and crusade and conquest and pestilence and the rise and fall of empires has all been based on this false version of Christianity that was cooked up back in Rome, back in those days of Rome, defined through a filter of men's doctrines that keep the doors of the kingdom shut up against men over a millennia, close, close 
this closing in on 17, 1800 years here, with very few exceptions, as I mentioned. Even as the world attempted then to emerge from this oppression, this, this horrible oppression in this period of the Dark Age, the Inquisitions, the Crusades, the murder, the, the bloodshed that took place, all in the name of God, the, the kingdoms that rose and fall, emerged finally in, in the Renaissance, more, more likely in a historical sense, into the Reformation, even then, even then, the Christian system that existed exchanged one form of tyranny for another form of repression. That's what they did. That's why I said suppressing, repressing the truth, you know, holding it in unrighteousness. That's all they did. So they broke away from the oppression of popery of the, of the system, the Roman system. Much of the world did at that time. And what, what did they do in their Protestantism? It, they removed the shackles that they were under to a more tolerant regime, perhaps, of the kings and queens and the rulers, the elites, the potentates that ruled, ruled the day, but yet they were not able to sever their ties to this guy, Augustine's fallacies. They were not able to do that. And he's the rotten root of the tree. If you, drew it, if you drew this as a tree with branches instead of this, you'd have him at the very root, the rotten root of that tree that's produced this paganism in the churches, where it all changed drastically in 3rd and 4th century Rome, when the gospel of full ability and repentance and faith proven by deeds was pretty much eliminated on the face of the earth, with, with a few exceptions, as I said. So they cast off one form of tyranny, but kept, fell, fell under another form of repression in Protestantism. So even though the Bible was translated then into the common languages of the people at the advent of the printing press, where it became more easily available, it was still subject to the higher authorities of the church to, to then d disseminate it into the creeds that were popping up all over the place. Therefore, then, we take a pure form of Christianity, as they call it, the Puritans, quickly became Puritanical, just like their roots in Rome of the oppression and the persecutions. So under this Puritanical authority, they defined the gospel as the tulip, the first, the first leg here of our journey. They defined it as the tulip, finally then codifying it up into the 16, early 1600s, into the Westminster Confession. They're tied right together. If you ever study those documents with, a, with an eye discerning of the truth that's come out of this mess, you'll see every one, every single one of the doctrines and excuses that they make up today are in there. It's in there. It's in my Bible article if you want to see it up on my website. I went through the whole thing, and you'll see every excuse and every mimic thing that comes out of the mouths of the people today is based on the tenets of the Westminster Confession, which was based on this puritanical idea that this immutability of God and total depravity of man and unconditional election and all that other stuff, all that nonsense that came out of the mind of Mr. Augustine in one way or another. So what they did was they defined Christianity through that filter that man was totally unable to obey God, totally unable to obey God. And consequently then, and again, this is of course for the most part, there was always exceptions, small exceptions, just like there is now. So for the most part then, consequently, instead of presenting the simple message of repentance and faith proven by deeds, returning to the ancient roots of the church, they deemed all those guys heretics after the apostles, because they think the apostles taught this stuff in the, in the Bible naturally. That's what they use. They use the scripture. They deceitfully use the scriptures to try to prove it. So instead of returning to that, what did they do? They muddied the waters with more violence and diversions and div divisiveness that obscured the truth in the doctrines of men. And all this I just pointed out, the two of the Westminster, the Wesleyans, the Calvins, the, the Armenians, the, the, uh, the Antinonianism, all the other stuff that came out of those days. And I've studied it in massive detail. And uh, 
I, I've seen it all. So that's exactly what they did. Thereby, they fulfilled what the prophet Ezekiel said in, in Ezekiel 13.22, where it says, They strengthen the hand of the wicked so that no one turns from his wicked ways to save his life. They'd tell him to turn. They'd preach against the, the drunkenness and the, and the perversions back at, way back there. They don't now. But back in the 17, 1800s, they did because there was more of a stigma attached to divorce and to adultery and to all that other stuff. But then at the same time, it was underscored by the fallacies that God did it all for you. So man constantly kept falling right back into it because the fallacy taught him 